Hello, it's me, Jeremy Jane from Noclip, coming live to you from, uh, from a tree. Um, this is a series in which I will be learning to make games, which is an intimidating prospect given that my job is to go around talking to people who make the best games in the world. I started tinkering with Unity a couple years ago and gave it up for like a year or a year and a half or something like that, because it's really hard. <laughs> but it's something that I'm really interested in learning. And uh, I think that the Noclip documentaries are interesting from the perspective that they tell the story of the creation of these great pieces of art by these incredibly technically proficient people. And so what I hope to do with this is to apply that same mentality of documenting the creative process, but to someone who has a lot of passion, <laughs> but absolutely no technical know-how. Now you might say to yourself, why would anyone care about someone who makes amateurish little Unity projects? Well. I think that the interesting thing here... <laughs> I think that the interesting thing here will be... <laughs> My experience working in Unity is incredibly limited. It's something I've been dabbling at for a while, but cumulatively it's probably a handful of months at most. And all of that basically has been in 2D except for a couple recent prototypes. But despite my lack of experience, I figured an interesting angle for this devlog would be, what if I really just swing for the fences? What if I learn to make games in 3D by making an immersive sim? Something inspired by arcane games like Dishonored and Prey and Deathloop. Not just because it'll be funny to watch me fail, but because these are the games that I like the most. They're the games that I think are the most interesting from a design standpoint, and the games that I enjoy playing. Now, if you've ever made games before or know anything about making games, you know this is a terrible idea, and that immersive sims are one of the most demanding things you could possibly make with a billion things that could possibly go wrong. Well, alright, so what if, instead of making a full immersive sim, instead I make a smaller game that utilizes a lot of the same ideas and systems, and then at that point, then I could expand it later on. I could use a lot of those systems again and build something larger with them, and it'll serve as sort of a proof of concept. Not a proof of concept that I can make a game, but just as a proof of concept that I can make the bare minimum foundation for a game. But figuring out a smaller game idea proved to be its own challenge. And so I'd have an idea, excitedly jot down a bunch of thoughts about it, and then record myself talking about it, and then wake up the next day full of doubt, crumple up all my notes, and start from square one again. And try to make an immersive sim. A logic puzzle, like not puzzle kind of game. That is inspired by both the kind of like indie horror world. Nothing happens. It's just a game where people tell you you're going to be scared. And also inspired by games like Firewatch. Mechanics like Forgotten City and uh, Oberdin. Hopefully, what I'd like to avoid doing is, is pivoting again to different ideas. A piece of advice that I've heard over and over about game dev is that you should try to finish projects. And I think this is really good advice, but I think that the hidden other side of the coin for me, at least when it comes to this idea, is that I feel so intimidated by the idea of spending several months, if not years, on an idea that I'm not really dedicated to, that isn't the perfect idea, that I get analysis paralysis. And I get stuck in this phase where like, I have to come up with the perfect project before I make anything. And so the things I end up making are very surface level because I never feel like I come up with the perfect idea to commit to. And so a little bit of insight that came to me during this process was, that it's okay to start with the wrong idea and not to finish it, but to at some point figure out what you want to do later down the road. And so at this point, instead of cycling through a few different ideas I had and genres that I was excited about, I figured it was best just to kind of start making stuff. I knew that this game was going to be first person, so I built a first person controller by referencing old scripts and watching a bunch of tutorials. And then I added things like crouch and zoom, and the ability to pick up physics objects that are properly designated, and the ability to bring one physics object to another and have them interact in a way that changes a variable in the script of both objects. 
And little things like this started to excite me because I could see the potential in them. Even though I was just bringing a giant orange over to a pot of soup and changing a boolean variable from not poison to poison, I could see how small ideas like this set the stage for me to come up with big ideas down the road. Like sure, this was just flipping a switch in a script that the soup pot had on it, but maybe there's a barracks full of guards, and instead of going in and killing them all one by one, you find a way to sneak in and poison their soup, and the fight is over without a single shot fired. Once the gears were turning in my head about these big ideas that could blossom out of little tiny prototyped ideas, it had a snowballing effect. Like as I started to model food items, I decided to learn how I could trigger an animation with my controller. And so I made a fridge that opens, and then wrote a script to trigger that animation, and then attached colliders and rigid bodies to the fridge so that it could contain other objects I'd made. And small ideas like modeling a 3D orange gave me big ideas like painting a night sky and projecting it onto the inside of the sphere, and then making the sphere huge and putting my entire prototype inside of it, and then having that sphere rotate so that it's like the night sky rotating above you. And something as simple as understanding how cameras work in Unity gave me the idea to make a cell phone camera that gives an entirely different perspective on the scene. And some of these ideas were just for fun, like I put a debug thruster jump in to get around the scene quickly, with no intention of putting it into the game, but then once I put it in, I decided to fly to the moon on a whim, and it felt like I was playing a game like Outer Wilds or something, because all it does is add a bunch of upwards velocity onto the player character, and so you could kind of feather it to thruster your way and slow your descent down towards the Earth. And I started to see the way that just generating new ideas like this for fun could also be a method of coming up with new game mechanics that I hadn't anticipated putting in. Like, this game probably won't have a thruster jump, but who's to say that's not something I'll use in a future game idea? Or that I can't take that idea and start generating game ideas around it just because it feels fun to play with. And the more I made, the more my confidence grew. At some point, I realized that just walking around in this prototype didn't really feel like a game, no matter how many interactions I put in, because I wasn't communicating any information about this world. And so I figured at some point, I would have to make a dialogue system in UI. So using the cell phone camera idea as a stepping stone, I devised a system to have you receive pieces of dialogue through a text message on your phone. And each piece of dialogue would have corresponding responses so that you could hold F at any time, bring up a very janky radial menu, and select your response. I didn't go so far as to write a bunch of dialogue for this prototype, but I did enough testing to know that this system works flawlessly, and it may be a little rough around the edges. Like, I don't know if this is the perfect dialogue system to implement into like a 40 hour open world game, but for a small indie game, it's a totally functional dialogue system that could have branching options and dialogue that's reactive to the player's choices. And that was really exciting to me. That felt like a, a page was turning. I had attempted to code kind of a rudimentary version of this dialogue system in a previous Unity project, and it didn't quite work out right, so coming back to it and succeeding at this stage felt really good. Because as mundane as it is to have a really ugly UI where you interact with a character who doesn't say anything really, I could see the potential in these ideas. I could see that if I were to take the time to write a story, this dialogue system would work to handle the dialogue for the entire game, and that's really cool to me. And so one of the takeaways from this process was learning to enjoy the making of tools. In game dev, especially when you're first learning, not everything you make is going to be a fun, interactive thing that you can jump into a prototype with and play around. Sometimes you just have to make the quality of life stuff or the things that convey information to the player. And even though these things have always intimidated me so much that I've stayed away from them, Finally getting up the courage and focus to just sit down and make these things until they were functional was... It was a feeling that really changed my relationship to game dev, because every challenge you overcome makes every subsequent challenge feel more attainable. Like, I didn't think I was going to make a dialogue system for this first episode, because I figured it would be kind of like... I figured it wasn't visually interesting enough to put in a devlog, but it's like, it's such an essential part of a game, and what I'm hoping is that the people who are watching this understand that the point of this devlog is to show how someone who has a very rudimentary understanding can learn all of these things using resources that are freely available on the internet and a healthy dose of caffeine and hyperfixation 
and create systems and overcome challenges that I'd always told myself were totally impossible for someone like me who had no technical training. By the point I finished the dialogue system, I started to revisit the question of what type of game I was actually making. Everything I had made was generalized enough that I could still basically pivot in any direction, but I figured before I went any further, it felt important to me to revisit the trajectory that I was on and make sure I was still headed in the right direction. And so an idea occurred to me. A lot of my favorite games from the last several years have been games where you're gathering clues and using deductive reasoning to put together kind of a mystery. And so I thought on a small scale this would be an interesting game to make, like a murder mystery game where you're collecting clues, but also on a larger scale, maybe that would be an interesting hybrid with the immersive sim genre too, like an immersive sim where you're also engaging in clue finding. And I think Deathloop kind of had shades of this, with their Outer Wild style like pin board to put together clues, but I see a lot of potential in this subgenre that hasn't been explored yet that might resemble something like Firewatch or Disco Elysium more than it does Deathloop. So the next thing I made was a clue inventory, and UI is again one of these things that I've been putting off learning just because it seems so intimidating and dry, but it's, it's such an essential part of a game, and as soon as I had it in my game and had little like spinning icons for the clues you picked up, it, it felt really good to me. Like I, I'm very proud of how this came out, not because I think it's an incredibly impressive technical skill, but because it was a huge challenge for me to overcome, and a huge barrier between a Unity prototype where you're just going around picking up oranges, and one where you're going around and picking up clues and gaining information about the world in an interesting way. By this point, my confidence was at a new all-time high. I'd made a dialogue system, I'd made a clue UI, I'd created physics interactions, an FPS controller, I learned Unity's terrain tools, my 3D modeling had gotten a lot better. Like, here is a before and after of my first try at making a little soldier three months ago, and my most recent characters, who are kind of like little red wall style animals, but from like a mid 20th century revolutionary aesthetic. And so I decided, fuck it. I was gonna make some immersive sim style mechanics. So I hopped into a separate Unity project, and in one, I made shooting, which was really, really easy. Like something that is so core to my idea of an immersive sim or a first person shooter, and something that I thought would take a lot of work to get even like the beginning foundation of, was like, it took me like a few hours to figure out. It's just ray casting or like shooting a little prefab. And same thing with implementing Unity's nav mesh system. I thought it would be so hard to have AI that uses pathfinding and can like seek you out in the world or detect when you're nearby. And these were things that are really easily implemented in Unity, which I think is a feather in the cap not of me as a game developer, but of the modern game design tools that are available for people to use. So the last thing that I prototyped was a rope system, because in my idea, in my immersive sim, you're like shooting ropes up and you're climbing in windows and stealthing around kind of like thief. And I had mixed results with this. Like at first my physics anchors had a bunch of lines drawn between them, but the joints weren't working. So it ended up kind of just like a bunch of stiff logs. And then I got it to work a little bit better and it checks the space under each segment. And if that's blocked, it instantiates the next anchor farther forward so that these ropes kind of unfurl downward in a really interesting way. But even that ran into some bugs and it's not a system that's fully baked or ready to put in a game. But it was something that if you had asked me a while back, could you prototype a system of climbing ropes? I would have said not in a million years could I make something like that. That is absolutely outside of my expertise and it always will be. And so at the end of this process, I am kind of back where I started. Like I had the, the naive perspective at the start that I could make a huge immersive sim and then in the middle, I was like, there's no way I could do that, I need to make something smaller. And then after prototyping a bunch of the necessary systems to make a smaller game like that happen, I realized that like, I could build the tools to make the game of my dreams. And it might take me a long time, but the fact that I can do it 
is something that I didn't even really dare to dream at the start of this. Like, making an immersive sim as a pitch for this first devlog was almost like a joke, but the last thing I expected was to build enough momentum in the process that I was like, you know what? Maybe I can do this. So at this point, we've got everything you need to make a walking simulator. A uh, first-person controller, the ability to interact with physics objects and containers, a dialogue system that works perfectly fine, a UI that could be used to sort through clues or objects you collect. And at one point, I built a system to trigger another camera to come on with a pre-recorded animation to be kind of like a first-person cinematic. And I made and animated a little physics truck for you to ride in the back of so that the intro to the scene is you riding into the town in the back of a truck and getting to look at this landscape. Combined with the work in progress prototypes for shooting and rope climbing, this is starting to look way more like an immersive sim prototype than I thought I could ever reach in a couple weeks. And so I think the proper course of action from here is to think really hard about the kind of immersive sim that I want to make. This was something that I felt I couldn't seriously entertain at the beginning of this devlog because it just felt too ambitious. Like thinking about level design when I didn't have any of the systems in place felt absolutely ridiculous, but now I could see a world in which I could build a one level prototype. A prototype that has NPCs you can talk to, doors, containers, enemies who can detect you and follow you and shoot at you, and you can shoot back at them. And with a little refinement, hopefully, the ability to throw up ropes and climb through windows. So I know this first devlog is more of a tool building session than a prototyping session, but it feels like a really important transitional step for me between just loading a bunch of 3D objects into Unity and actually doing something with them, actually turning them into something that could resemble a prototype. And so at this point, I think it's back to the drawing board. I think it's back to the idea generating phase. And hopefully, once I sit down and think a little bit harder about this idea with my newfound momentum, I'll have some interesting level ideas that are directly spawned from the types of experiences I had making these systems, but with a completely different type of mindset. Instead of dreaming about some lofty game idea that I know I'll fall short of, I can now start to dream about small pieces of a big idea with confidence that I could actually achieve it. When I started this project, I was thinking a lot about what kind of game I wanted to make and what I wanted to say with that and kind of thinking about these broad, sort of like sweeping, artistic uh, perceptions of what I was going to make. And instead, as I've come to work on it, I've found that it's, it's more useful to have kind of a craftsman mindset. So a lot of it is just like, it's not about these grand, sweeping, artistic visions. It's just about like, how do I make an inventory work? But that being said, I do think it's really important to think about those big questions, like the bigger kind of like artistic or like more philosophical questions about creative projects. If there's no larger artistic vision or whatever, creative vision driving the things that you're prototyping as a, in a more like craftsman or technician mindset, then um, there's no motivation for it. Like. The thing that motivates me to spend hours working on these things and learning these things is that I want to create all of these tools uh, from a more technical standpoint so that I can use them to tell stories and create experiences and games and all these things. And so it's kind of what I found is it's like game dev is this unique kind of art form, at least in my very limited experience, where it's a huge push and pull between the, the craftsman technician mindset in the like artistic mindset and you kind of need to go between the two because without the uh without the artistic perspective you're just like building tools for no purpose and without the craftsman technician mindset you're just like oh i want to make like this evocative game where you're like in nature it's like so beautiful but then you know you don't have the the tools to do that a lot of the things i'm building are uh are, are scaffolding onto which I can put uh, more ambitious projects in the future. And that's what makes me feel really good about this. It's not that I think that the little mystery game I'm building is a masterpiece. It's that I think it has built enough skills for me to feel like I can build something bigger and more ambitious in the future. And that's exciting to me. And and also, like it's, it's fine if you fall short of those grand artistic ambitions, but having them in the first place is kind of the, the fire that uh, lights the uh, hot air balloon. This metaphor is falling apart. Um, but yeah, so uh, feeling pretty good about this. 
not totally making a fool of myself by, by documenting this process, which is good. 